All right, students, welcome to module one, information systems in business. You may or may not be familiar with management information systems or MIS, but you have interacted with it, whether you know it or not. When you've registered for a class at St. Francis, that is a management information system. It takes your inputs and gives you outputs, and in between there's a lot of hardware and software and different tech that processes that and models it and gives you relevant outputs to what you're needed. Anytime you go to Sheets out in Crescent or your local Sheets and you order something from the MTO machine, that's, that's an MIS system, ATMs, Amazon, all of these are management information systems and they take relatively large complex tasks and make them instantaneous and incredibly easy for both the consumer and the organization. All systems share these four common things, data, database, processes, and information. Data is your input to the system. This is what we're feeding it. It could be internal data. They could be sales records, personnel records. They can be external data from your customers, your competitors, your suppliers. All of this information by itself can be extremely overwhelming and hard to process. So to process it, it needs to go into a database. A database is just a all the data organized in a series of relevant and intelligent files. This is how we form our MIS and we have database management systems, DBMS, and these are programs that create and organize and manage all this data for us and turn it into something usable. But what really makes it usable is the process side of it. This is where we can take all of this raw information and we can model it. When we model data, we it's almost, I don't want to say you're manipulating the results, but what we're doing is we are pushing the data into something that we can use. We're manipulating the data to make useful results. Just having sales data doesn't really mean anything to us. But if we could take that sales data and combine that to demographic of our customers, these are what all the men buy. These are what the women buy. We can break it down by age. That is incredibly, incredibly useful information. We need to make sure that the information are outputs. Because remember, your data is your inputs. Your information is your outputs. We need to make sure that information has quality to it. Um, is it timely? If we're talking about sales records and the information you give me is four, five, six months old, is that really helpful to me you know if it's if it's four months old and we're moving into a holiday season we're moving into christmas that that really i can't make good decisions based off of that can i take that data and integrate it with other information you know take that sales data and take that from our supplier data hey this is what we're selling a lot this is what we can ship in this is when we can ship it in those two are going to mesh and they're going to help us make good decisions how accurate is this data and are we being consistent with it? Sometimes when you run models and they can be on the, the same data points, they're just all over the place. If we want to get a good demographic of our shoppers and we want to know, hey, what are the men 18 to 25 buying? And every time we run this model with slightly different tweaks, we're just getting information all over the place. That's almost useless. It's hard for management to make good decisions from it. Uh, and finally, is it relevant? Is the data that you're feeding me as management relevant to the decisions I'm making to the company and to the direction that we want to go? Having raw information or information in just a bar graph can be difficult for some people to understand. It's incredibly helpful to extrapolate that information and show it in multiple formats, graphs, tables, reports, white pages, anything that we can really beat the information to everybody in a way that is very easy for them to understand. You can have the best pie chart in the world, but if management can't understand that or the information isn't clear to them, you might as well throw it away. It doesn't help. What all this can do is this can help us use all this information to solve problems. Uh, we see at the bottom rumors, unconfirmed reports, or stories. Your data is truth. It is facts. We can use this to 
stamp out rumors, confirm rumors. You know, if we know that, hey, there's rumors there's this new fad coming out and everybody's buying this type of shirt. Well, we haven't sold any. Well, there we go. We, we, we could start to squash that down, but we can keep tracking these rumors and bouncing it off data so we can make better use of our supply chains to keep up with trends. Let's look at some examples. We, we talked about St. Francis when you're registering for class, but everything the university has, all the information we have on you goes into the university's DBMS. Your name, your age, gender, major, nationalities, the list goes on and on and on. Well, why do we need this? Why do we want this information? Well, it can help us plan. We want to know, hey, how many students are in major? What major is growing the fastest? If all of a sudden there's this huge influx of students enrolling in the Shield School of Business, that, that, that's going to make us try to pivot where we're going. Do we have enough faculty to teach these students? Do, do we have enough room in classrooms? Do we need to buy more chairs? There's a whole bunch of questions that start getting asked when you see a spike like this. Uh, what is the age of the student body? What is for our international students? Where are the most of our international students? Are they coming from Europe? Are they coming from Asia? You know, information like that, we can really help. Do we have enough recreational things on campus that these students want? Maybe we're getting more older students. Maybe we're getting more students from, from Asian countries. Can we have entertainment for them? Can we keep them occupied and entertained and happy on campus? What's our ratio of male to female students? All of this goes into long-term planning into the university and it helps us create a better environment for our students both on campus and for our remote students as well. If we're a textile company, you know, same thing. We're using a lot of this raw data coming in and having good information. What salesperson is generating the highest sales or who's generating the lowest sales? Uh, what product is generating the highest or lowest sales? What region is, is outperforming? You know, if the Northeast is outperforming more than any other region, but we have the most sales associates in the Southwest, maybe we need to reallocate where people are going. Uh, I want to sidetrack a little bit on that first point, which salesperson generates the highest sales. As, as a manager, as a leader in an organization, this can be incredibly useful to give credit where credit is due. Uh, and this is something I learned very early on in the Navy. Um, people perform better typically when we give recognition for when they go above and beyond. If you have an employee who is constantly you know, meeting or exceeding his quotas, or just always that go-to individual who you have a question, they have an answer, or they'll get it to you really quick. Um, go out of your way to acknowledge them. Go out of your way, you know, praise publicly if you want to. Um, you, use your use your common sense on that. Maybe that person will get embarrassed with public praise, but at the very least, send them an email, call them, swing by their desk, make sure they know you care make sure they know that you know hey you're doing a really good job keep it up and on the flip side of it that can help encourage other people to go above and beyond and get the recognition they they may want it wouldn't be a business class if we don't talk about porter's five forces um if this is new for you or if you haven't talked about porter's five forces in a while I highly encourage you to use quickmba.com. That's quickmba.com. Um, they have an excellent write-up on Porter's Five Forces. The website's a little dated, I'll give it that, but um, really high-quality information on there. And, you know, I find it best for concepts like this. You know, take the book, take what you've learned previously, take quickmba.com, take as many sources as you can to go over buying power, supplier power, threat of substitutes, new entrants and rivalry, and you know, get different viewpoints on this. It's the same information, but it's written and presented in a different way. I know some students that have a hard time. When I taught a MIS 102 class, when we talked about Porter's Five Forces in there, the it was presented in a unique way, and some students had difficulty under, understanding Porter's Five Forces in regards to the text but quickmba.com was there, and that was something that just the light bulb came on for them.
So go over this, I would expect as graduate students, this is not your first time with Porter's Five Forces. So what does the future look like and how does this affect MIS? One of the biggest things, and we see in the technology world, we, see, we, we say this a lot, that the cost of processing your hardware and software is slowly approaching zero. When you think about cloud computing and mass cloud computing, server farms and everything else, it is so cheap to have large data, large processing power that it almost makes having servers on site too costly and it doesn't make sense anymore. Uh, the company I work for, we don't even have servers on site anymore. It was too expensive to have the upkeep of maintaining them in our building. Everything is through the cloud now, and it, the price for processing power that we pay is just, it, it blows your mind how low cost and affordable it is, but you're still getting that high quality speed, high quality bandwidth, and raw storage space that we need. Uh, we see more and more users are being more computer literate. Um, you know, look back two or three generations, you know, even in the 70s, 80s, Computers are there, people wouldn't know how to use them. Going into the 90s when graphical user interfaces become more popular, Windows 95, OS 6, 7, 8 on the Mac side. Um, even then, people weren't as computer savvy as they are today, and it just keeps getting better and better and better. The internet will obviously grow. The internet is not going away, but it will keep evolving. Uh, so much so that large companies and small mom and pop shop companies are almost on the same footing. You know, you can have a really great product, be a small company of four or five people, and still have international sales. Um, 30, 40, 50 years ago, that would be unthinkable for a small company like that. And, you know, middle America have an international presence, but we see this now. Um, now, on the bad side of that, because the internet is growing, because people are becoming more computer savvy, um, computer crime is becoming more prevalent and more sophisticated. We need to make sure we protect the information we have and do it in a way that is extremely difficult for malicious individuals to break into our system, steal our customer data, and steal our intellectual property. We're seeing more IoT, Internet of Things devices, um, and and th these are your smart light bulbs, smart watches, smart refrigerators. Uh, it's amazing all the products that are connected to the Internet. You know, if you would have talked to me in the, the mid the early 90s and say, oh, my TV's online, my refrigerator's online. It, nobody would have understood why we need that or, or what information we're getting from that. But it's incredibly useful. Is it a necessity? Eh, probably not, but it's incredibly useful. Uh, we're seeing more 3D and 4D printing. It's to the point now for, you know, less than 600 bucks, your average person can have a 3D printer at home with, uh, you know, AutoCAD or some free CAD program and start prototyping, start making, physically making a usable device in their home. Uh, before this would be, you know, hours and hours of planning, different making models and clay, pouring in different you know metals or whatever to make it but now we can quickly prototype things uh 3d printing is already revolutionary it's just going to make making things at home easier and better for small companies large companies and everything else we talked about cloud computing smart devices they're everywhere and security is getting better too as criminals are getting better security is getting better um, we see that at the annual Black Hat Hacking Conference where you have, uh, quote unquote, good hackers, white hat hackers working with organizations to find exploits and patch them before, before they get out to the general public or even once they're out into the general public. I know this was a, a quick overview, uh, but if you have any questions, please reach out to me and keep on going. Good luck.